Talking Tech, brought to you by our friends at Client Server. My name is Michael Oliver, and every time we do a Talking Tech episode, it's it's one of the great things I enjoy about it is that we get to meet people from all different industries who all have an interest in the tech in the tech sector, who are all doing something interesting and are doing things to advance the world, and make things a better place, and. Today's guest is absolutely no exception to this. In fact, you might as well say she is changing the way the world is working. Her name mm-hmm. is Indy Gregg. She is the CEO and founder of WeDo, which is an all-purpose app for freelancers. And we'll get into exactly what WeDo is about and where it's come from and what the goal is. But I'd just like to say a, a profound and exciting hello, uh, Indy. Thank you for tuning in. Hi. Hi, Michael. It's good to be here. It's great to have you along. Great to have you along. Your journey into into the world of tech is sort of by no means conventional. Like it's it's one of the really interesting backstories. Can you tell me a little bit about how things started for you? Um, I started uh, in the digital industries in 1993, 1994. Um, I was working for Sony Digital in the south of France, and and shortly after that, I began to build websites and. Um, small applications and just, you know, worked kind of as a freelancer for, for a good while. Um, and then I was picked up as an artist. Um, my husband left me and I had three really tiny kids and I decided I'd just become a rock star one day. So I wrote a bunch of songs and got a deal and uh, went on tour and, and yeah, and that led to fighting pirates. So I built a platform uh, after following that called Cartoons. And, and we had around 14 and a half million users. And yeah, so I got really heavily um, involved in tech more intensely at that point. Um, and then, yeah, founded some companies. And that brings me into today. So this, was it so much that you, during the course of your journey, you just found that in order to get the things you wanted to do, embracing technology was the best way to do it? Were you always someone who was really interested in tech? Were you someone who coded or you kind of nerdy and geeky like me growing up? What was, what was the story there? Yeah, I, I coded growing up and I, uh, I was both creative and a coder, um, you know, learned with the MS DOS and the early um, systems when we were really small um, and just kind of worked my way through HTML, CSS, JavaScript, you know, C, C plus, C plus plus, all the, all the usual suspects um, as, technology progressed so uh, you know once you learn one language it's easy to build off of that but I think I found later uh, that I was more interested in what can what what kind of tools can make life better for people so I really focused on that more than just building any old tech for tech's sake like you do when you're maybe younger exploring Um, but yeah (laughs) <laughs> was there a particular language you liked more than others? I mean, I, I always like asking this question because I feel like it does sort of reveal quite a lot about a person's psyche, particularly in the tech world. Was there, do you like the, the, the in-depth kind of, nut, you know, axe to the grindstone way of C++ or what, what kind of uh, language would you fancy? Well, I like more creative languages. I think more building languages more than anything like, you know, JavaScript and yeah. That, that's kind of, it's more fun to build things that you can see, um, I think, more quickly. Um, I like, I don't know. I don't really have a preference for languages. Um, I like English. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I like say it. English and French. But in, tech, in the tech world, it really depends. I mean, I use editors a lot, so there's always these shortcuts. So once you kind of get the feel for something, you can mess around with it and I think it's more depending on what you get used to using most like in in whatever lane you're you're working in so I don't think anybody could really say there's a preference you know yeah absolutely and and (laughs) it's all it's it's all led you to here you are today as the founder and CEO of we do can you tell me a little bit about we do and what and what we do does if that if that's a fun sentence to say out loud what does we do do we do saves time, money, and energy for people, um, primarily. I mean, we say we're focusing on the freelance uh, market. It's really the ind- independent economy. So um, we're focusing on uh, 
helping creators, helping uh, freelancers, helping coaches and consultants uh, remove barriers in their processes. It's a ba basically a neo bank at the core of the, of the business, um, banking services. But on the front end, we offer video, audio, chat, um, in-stream payments, processing, the ability to broadcast and create communities around your brand or your product or your service as well as one-to-one -one and easy payment invoicing and contracting. So it's, um, it's kind of business in a box with social network effect, if, if that makes sense. Um, you can really create a, quite a robust environment around your, yourself and your business uh, using weed. Absolutely. So how did that start? Is it, like I said, your, your background is so interesting. You have certainly got that entrepreneurial streak running through you. What was the opportunity you saw? What, what made you think this is something that really, this is a problem that needs to be solved? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of times you're solving your problem for yourself or for, or for others. And when you know you've got something that can remove kind of a lot of pain points, that's when you go ahead. Um, for, for me, I've been a consultant for about 10 years. And, and and, you know, I was earning customers and finding clients on sites like, you know, your, your Fiverr's freelancers, Upworks and whatnot. And I found it really annoying that they take between 20 and sometimes 50% of your income, uh, uh, and, you know, that, that cut, and it seems sustainable. And, and for me, me, that trajectory of freelancing becoming uh, uh, eventually more popular globally than employment was pretty obvious and make even advanced that accelerated that quite a bit. So the idea of 20% on everything, it seems for half the workforce seemed kind of unsustainable to me. And, and basically what a freelancer does is come out on to what they charge the client. And of course that means, means the, the client hiring you is paying an extra. So it just seemed kind of way to cut out the middleman and create a model that would work uh, on banking service and a payment service. Why not do that? People already bank. Uh, they already are charged payment fees to process payment. Uh, and so since we could do this for a lot cheaper future of work. I think, um, a, a, apologies to those tuning in at are the you? moment. I, th I think we have uh, some a slight uh, lag in the audio at the moment. There might be somebody saying uh, it looks like there, there might be might be having some uh, my issues. So if there is a if there are delays, we apologise for that, and we will we will push forward as, as best we can. Um, so my my next my, ne my next question, I'm, I'm going to hope it comes through, and uh, um, apologies if it doesn't. Uh, you you mentioned that that um, COVID sort of precipitated a lot of the sort of the work and the thinking that went into we do and you, you started it, you founded it in february 2020 so it's sort of like right on the brink of the of the <laughs> pandemic you know taking off so what sort of tell us a little bit like what was that like because there's by no means ideal circumstances to be launching any business much less one which is sort of focused on a very particular niche area like like freelance what was that experience like um, to be honest, I don't feel like it changed anything. The fact that COVID was present, 
it probably just made me want to work harder and be more intense, um, intensely focused. Because I think the one gift that COVID gave most people was the gift of time hmm. <laughs> due to the lockdowns. Um, so launching a business during COVID for me is the same as launching at any other time, uh, considering uh, that for female entrepreneurs, it's always a little bit more difficult than it is for our male counterparts, you know, in terms of raising capital or in terms of, you know, uh, finding people or partners who can work with you and take you seriously. So I just treated it like it, it was any old day. Um, but I was determined whether COVID was coming or not to, to get the job done. Um, I'm one of these people that once I have an idea that I know I can pursue, uh, that I just go all the way home with it, but it doesn't happen that often. I don't just yeah. get involved in any old project. I'm very particular about, is this idea sustainable? Will the model work? Uh, does this solve problems for people? Is this something that's totally scalable? And for me, the this ticked all the boxes. It made sense to do it, even though I didn't know COVID was coming when I, when I started. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I think COVID made it even more interesting because you could see the acceleration of the side hustle, people losing their jobs at a relatively rapid pace during COVID. Um, the lockdowns really slowed down most of the world. So uh, I believe that not just freelancing, but the entire creative gig economy um, are really the future of work in many ways. A, a big portion of the global workforce will will be in those in that sector of the economy and it's underserved so absolutely speaking of the freelance market right now and so much of the conversation if you if you're reading you know any newspaper or any news site is about you know, potential slow or slowdown potential recession what is your sense of where the free market sorry the freelance market is right now is it's much like you know any like any recession where people you know lose jobs a lot of people you know jump on their own bandwagon and start building their own sort of own little startup up is is that a sense that can you see those sort of uh, ingredients starting to come together now what's your read on things i think that with a imminent global recession which it seems as though we may be heading into um more and more companies are going to be driving lean teams and lean organizations. So that means they'll be getting ready to get rid of a fair number of people in order to stay lean. Um, and so during that time, the side hustle becomes more important. Uh, businesses are also looking for fractional workers. Um, there are benefits to hiring uh, freelancers, of course, because uh, you don't have to pay social contributions. And, and you see that more and more um, today. And that's part of why freelancing is growing. And mm -hmm. on the flip side, freelancers can be fractional and work with multiple clients. And it's interesting for them. It gives them more diversity in the jobs that they work in and um, gives them more flexibility as well. Uh, when you work a nine to five, you're being kind of... Uh, pulled into one direction with all your eggs in one basket. Uh, so you de-risk yourself as a freelancer uh, a lot. And I think many people aren't really aware. They think that they're employed. Oh, you've got all these benefits or you have this social umbrella or you have this or you have that. Ultimately, you don't. Uh, when businesses have to shave down during recession and cut costs, um, you know, they lay people off. So um, unfortunately, but fortunately for we do, uh, a recession could actually mean an upside for a company like we do. Um, mm -hmm. And somebody has to pick up the slack if, uh, if socially people aren't um, prepared to vote in legislation that helps uh, the independent worker and the consultant who happen to drive a, a huge percentage of the economy uh, globally. Unfortunately, there isn't much umbrella for them. So we are looking at solutions in order to create that for them. 
and that's the real drive you know is to help more people help more people absolutely so you're you're not i would say worried that that, that sounds you know, sounds like you're not, uh, you're not taking in the full scope of it but I, it absolutely sounds like you are but you see that there is there is opportunity and that you haven't arrived at the wrong time Absolutely. If there's more opportunity now than ever during a global recession for a product like ours. Um, we are that, we're that go-to place when someone does lose their job or when somebody does need a side hustle or even for businesses who are trying to, you know, garner more customers. Um, marketplaces are very important during, um, during recessions. Uh, and I know there's a lot of talk about doom and gloom, but there's always opportunity in, re in downturn markets as well as upturn markets. Um, it's just about regenerating the economy any way we can during a recession. Um, and businesses like we do, are that's what we're here for. Before you um, before you joined in um, on the on the call, I, I understand him was that you were you were talking you know, meeting with investors. You're still looking to looking for capital, still looking to bolster that. How What's the sort of the appetite at the moment for from investors? Is it, are they sort of hedging their bets a little bit, or is it a product like we do and a company like we do just still a really appetizing offer without uh, without kind of okay. giving away too much of the family silver here? Well, what what's the yeah. kind of enthusiasm on the on the investment front? Well, uh, we just opened our round, so it's early days, but I do have uh, meetings with seven VCs this week. I just had two today. Um, so there is definitely an appetite and, and they found us, we didn't find them per se. Um, but you know, there's always, uh, there's always opportunity and there's always investment. There's a lot of money out there now, whether or not an investor, um, you know, is looking for like, for example, investment, uh, VCs and investors may de-risk themselves a little bit more and invest in. Uh, more developed com companies, you know, during this time frame, maybe less on early stage, super early stage startups or less on just the idea phase or, you know, um, in order to protect their portfolios. But I think long of the short, every recession, there's a there's a rebirth. So we know that this is just something we we move through in, in society as part of the laws of economics. Unfortunately, when you have quantitative tightening over a period of time or quantitative easing, you have the knock-on effect uh, some trimesters afterwards or some quarters afterwards. So with with the, uh, you know, amount of money that was put into the market during COVID, um, it's kind of expected that there will be some tightening um, over the next several months. Uh, and then there, there are other things going on in the world right now. So we don't know what we don't know. You know, there's a war going on and what we don't know where we'll be, but we never do. There's always volatility in the markets. Um, and so I think it's really more about placing your money and your bets on companies who are unstoppable and with teams who can deliver and with product that people need. Um, and timing is really important. You know, for a company like we do, the time is really now. I mean, it's it's right at this moment when this is really important for the market going forward. So we're in fairly decent position and we just hope that people are interested and yeah, join in on the round. We've already had a couple uh, investors already who've made commitments. So it's going well so far. And you know, these things take time. You got to kiss some frogs and talk to talk to people to find the fit of who's good for your company. Uh, you know, that's what I would say for any startup that's out there raising capital right now. Don't let the doom and gloom affect you. If you, if you've done your work, then you'll find your, you know, you'll find the right investors. I believe. Absolutely. Thinking about what the shape of we do at the moment, because it's when, when companies are sort of in those sort of those early days and trying to figure out not only the product and the, you know, the sales mechanism and everything, but also trying to sort of define that sense of culture and purpose and mission and what they're all about. When you are sort of positioning, we do to you know, potential employees and potential, you know, uh, people joining in, how, how, what kind of culture are you trying to create here? What, what is, what would working for we do be like? Well, our team is pretty special. 
Um, and it's extraordinarily exciting to get up in the morning and, and work with our people. Um, our culture is really a culture based on loving what we're doing and finding your, you know, finding your lane and assuming responsibility for your lane. Um, I think everyone at WeDo has a sense of ownership and everybody at WeDo also owns pieces of the company. We don't, you know, uh, we, we, we spread the love uh, in terms of uh, equity and with, with all of everyone who works here. They're, they receive options after a trial period. Um, they have a lot of fun. We, you know, we have off sites where we get together, um, but they work pretty hard. It's not unlikely for, you know, the design team to hang out at night together and knock something out and just have good fun together and bounce creative ideas. Um, our tech team are very driven. Uh, I meet with them every morning for the morning stand-up. They're pretty incredible. Product team's the same. Uh, just great people, really great people. And so, yeah, it, it, it's an environment where if you if you believe in pulling your weight and you believe in, you know, looking after your coworkers and helping each other out, then you probably get on really well. We do. So you are you are from obviously from the from the US, but you are you are based in in the UK. Is it, is there a sense of, you, of building the the company within the UK? Is there thoughts about establishing teams outside in, in different markets? What's the, the vision? No, we have teams outside in different markets. We have a team in Spain of nine people. Uh, we have a team in the U.S. of six people, and we have some team members also in the U.K., mm -hmm. uh, four or five people. So the majority, and then we have the team, a tech team that are in Turkey and in India. And we have a pretty uh, multicultural uh, family here at, at WeDo. So we have people f literally from all over the world that work um, remotely, and then some that work hybrid in the summer in, in the um, – HQ location. So, yeah. And so that's one of the things that a lot of businesses, particularly those in the tech sector, during the time of COVID were saying that even, you know, if there was one industry which was sort of, um, you know, likely to sort of embrace sort of remote teams and remote working and, you know, still maintain that sense of culture and purpose, it was the tech industry because mm. this is what yeah, you're already doing. Doing. Yeah. Already doing. yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> and, how has uh, so you said that's a fairly you know a, a large sort of geographical gap? You've got people stateside, Europe, UK, as well as India. How have you found kind of keeping that together? Is it is it the sense that once you get the mission, once you get the values all kind of in sync, it doesn't really matter where people are? They kind of buy into it and they just go from it, go from there. Well, it's flexible work anyway. So we really work on OKRs and KPIs. So, you know, each individual has a set of goals for their day, for their week, you know, for that month, for that quarter. Um, and so we don't care when they do the job as long as they get the job done. And that means a lot of people will, you know, maybe take their morning off and work, you know, East Coast time, even if they're in the UK or Europe or, um, you know, the Indians, they start a little bit later their work day so that they're in sync with the European time zone and um, East Coasters will ten, tend to maybe start, you know, their day to coincide. So it works really well regardless of geographic barriers. I think the funny thing about COVID is you couldn't see your neighbor. So you were Zooming with your neighbor anyway, right? So, and it didn't matter that it was your neighbor, you know, <laughs> or it doesn't really, distance doesn't matter when you're working in real time with people. Um, and we do get together. It is important to meet every once in a while face to face. So we schedule meetings and with small teams and small pods uh, so that people can get together and work together and meet face to face and, you know, understand each other's body language. So you get, not, you kind of get a vibe of, okay, when we're on chat, oh, he's probably thinking this or she's probably thinking that. Um, and we have a habit of actually talking to, to each other and turning our cameras on face to face so that we um, feel connected, even though we might not be in the same room. I think the one thing it does do is drive efficiency because uh, there are a lot of distractions in office culture um, and a lot of creativity, especially in design and, uh, and tech, uh, requires focus. 
So distractions are not welcome when you're working on a blog of something you don't want to hear the office gossip or, or whatnot. So it can be actually a lot more efficient to, to drive hybrid teams. Absolutely. And do you, do you uh, I guess as, as an American, you would you obviously you, you get back um, home every now and then. Do, do you visit the other offices? How often do you kind of touch base like in person? Yeah, I was just in the UK um, a couple weeks ago and I was out in, um, in Las Vegas uh, meeting with our, our team that is in California. And then we were at an offsite in San Diego. So, you know, we, we get around and, and, and it really is a ton cheaper than renting office space in any big city to have smaller spaces where people to get, get together doing offsites. Um, and who are near enough to each other that they can organize events together. Um, so that's that's really our plot is to have huddles, like little hubs of where people can get together and work together well, within a good close pros- proximity without having the overheads of office and, and everything else. So, Absolutely. yeah. Well, the the big story, certainly from from us working in the in the uh, the hiring hiring market is that, it's insanely hard to find people and that people are developers in particular in the tech sector are, if they're, if they're not, if they're being interviewed for a job that chances are they're being interviewed for at least three or four others. Uh, certainly yeah. the, the, the competition for talent is intense. How have you found that? What is the, because you have a, a really interesting value proposition and what you've just described seems to be the ideal environment for any techie to want to work in. But how have you found actually getting people to, you know, sign up and come on board. I, I found it awesome. Yeah. You know, the right people will be attracted to the what you're offering and the quality of the, the type of product that you're building and the reasons for building it. We do is a really exciting project. It's the type of project that, you know, could really change lives for a lot of people. And I think that is also part of the motivation. It's not always just salary. Um, mm-hmm. In in the competitive market, there are, there are multiple factors. Um, lifestyle is a big one. Flexibility is a big one. And the overall culture. If you're working with jerks, you know, or you, if you know this is going to be, a, you know, this might be really cool and elite, but you know, what quality of life? And I think more and more, especially young people, care more about who they work with and how cool it's going to be to hang out and do their job and actually enjoy it. And, you know, that's really one of our big cultural um, parts of this is that, you know, really loving what you're doing and really enjoying your team. And, you know, we check in and I just had a tech guy who joined um, a couple months ago, brilliant guy. And I was like, Hey, how are you getting on? I said, you know, how do you feel about your team? And he said, Oh my God, I love this. I love it. And when people are saying that, that's really important, um, that they feel like they're part of growing something that's uh, a really uh, an immersive team effort. And, you know, as we as we grow and scale, we hope to maintain that culture. Um, there aren't that many of us now. We're approaching 30. Uh, but, you know, there's a hurdle to cross over when you get to 50 and then 100. And as your company grows, uh, the challenge is to keep that type of culture so we're, we're hoping it just spreads along and, and we're reinforcing it day to day um, with each other. So, yeah. Absolutely. If anyone has any questions for Indy, please add them to uh, the chat either here on, I think we're on, on LinkedIn and Facebook. We will see the chat here at our, in our little HQ. So by all means, send your questions through. Uh, I want to ask you just very quickly about the, you know, the lessons you have learned, you know, you, you, this isn't your first rodeo. This is, you know, this is you've been involved in you know, a range of very successful startups. But if someone was thinking about kind of using, maybe even using we do as a, as a platform to, you know, kick off that side hustle and start that business and start growing, what, what, what are some of the three big takeaways you would have for someone who is contemplating getting involved in that, in that kind of thing? What, what would you say to someone starting out? Really evaluate your offer, your service, your product, and make sure you're solving a problem that exists in market. I guess that's probably one of the biggest things. 
do something that really you feel either energizes, inspires, or empowers you or other people, if you enjoy helping other people. Um, for me, the purpose of building anything technology-wise is really to help people um, and to help the planet, help something, right? Um, I feel like that's kind of the focus of everything that I do. And I think you need to find your, your own why, um, you know, uh, and find out what drives you and, and do something that really drives you because that's the only way you're going to do that over a long period of time and really still enjoy it and wake up three years, five years, 10 years later and say, I, I love this, you know, I love what I'm doing. Absolutely. So. And it, it's got to be that uh, that sort of emotional push to kind of to make the uh, make it all worthwhile, make it and certainly, you know, keep uh, intellect, both intellectually and emotionally, make sure that keeps uh, taking over. Uh, you have a question. You have a question here. And it's, it's one I'm actually embarrassed that I didn't ask you because I'm fascinated by this too. So mm -hmm. why did you decide to call the platform We Do? Um, because the power of we is so strong. A lot of, a lot of teams are founded by people who have a big ego. I don't believe in ego. I believe in, in working on things together. Um, that's really important. And do is about doing, you know, you spend a lot of your time in life in work doing so that you just work together. We do. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a fun name. <laughs> Cause it's like, what do you do? We do. Well, we do. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, speaking as a, someone who works in marketing, there's a, a lot of fun to be had with that. I'm, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> you can always think about, about 1,500 different strap lines and catchphrases to play with it. So it's, it's, it's almost too perfect. It's almost too perfect. <laughs> yeah, there um, can be a lot of comedy there. We do, like we do Dallas, you know, we do. Yeah, I, I hear you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, as as uh, 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 it's... One of the things that when I, I, I love interviewing women who work in, in the tech industry, I know that there's a the the phrase "women in tech" is now is is so it's more than just a catchphrase. It is it is more than just a movement. It is it is about a way of working in a predominantly heavy male male industry. How how does that shape your thinking, or do, do you see yourself as you know, as a woman in tech, or do you see yourself as a I'm an entrepreneur working within the tech industry who just happens to be happens to be a woman what's your thinking around that you know i i think when we get to the point where we have you know we respect each other's gender but it doesn't have an impact on what we do in life it'll be a nicer nicer world because this kind of men versus women you know thing is it's getting kind of old let's face it but women do have harder times because traditionally we didn't have as many women in technology or in industries that were pre primarily male dominated and that has a lot to do with culture the way women were raised to be nurturers and are nurturers you know as part of our dna um and it made you know yeah we we were funneled i guess from the 1920s 30s 40s 50s into being homemakers or nurses or secretaries or or whatever that was and i think the liberation in the 60s the civil rights movement that movement towards equality changed a lot of things for a lot of people um you know and equality is really important for our company that's why we have wes he's a triangle he represents those three sides uh, and equality um is really important but he's rounded He's, he doesn't have sharp edges, you see. So that balance between, you know, the company, the investor, the community, that balance between, you know, people and, and how, how we look after each other and serve each other. And ultimately, if we could get, get rid of, you know, if we didn't have to have diversity and inclusion, we just did that naturally, what a great world it would be, you know, so... So yeah, I don't see it as a as a problem. I see as I see a lot of solutions. I think that more women being trained in technology will fill that gap. I think as more and more women create scalable businesses and technology and innovation, and um, then we'll we'll see more and more women receive more investment and break more of those traditions, I guess, um, in in the world.
today. So, you know, the future's bright. We're training them up. There's more and more women coming into technology than ever before. So it's okay. Absolutely. And amen to all of that. Amen to all of that. Um, I think just before we before we wrap up, and I know if you if anyone else has any like last minute questions, please send them through. We will we'll try to get through to them as best we can. But I always like asking, this is my last question, kind of like thinking forward and thinking about the future. And if you were to kind of, you know, peer over the crystal ball and look over the next 12 to 24 months. I know, I know 2022, it's only six months old, but it's, you know, so much has happened and it's almost, almost been impossible to predict. But where yeah. would you like to be in the next 12 to 24 months? What's the kind of the vision and the, the thinking behind that? Yeah, so... You know, we'd like to be uh, well past the the, the go phase um, and scaling. Uh, we're planning to launch in Las Vegas, so we're going into the U.S. in September. Um, we, you know, with the best intentions, we'd like to be scaling relatively quickly um, and going into our Series A and potentially our Series B. Um, to expand the by the end of yeah 2022 early 20 sorry 2023 early 24 um, but we'll see what happens and we'll work really hard to create as much change as we can and and, and yeah create as much momentum and continue the massive momentum we've had already um, just great people uh, great networks of people around us um, just a wonderful uh, group of people who really believe that work needs to change, um, mm. that shouldn't be locked in a box from nine to five, uh, that there are more opportunities when people have goals and work on uh, OKRs and, and better methodology analytically, um, they perform better, they take breaks, they maybe you like to work at night. Some people don't want to work at eight o'clock in the morning. They do much better, highly productive around one o'clock in the afternoon or at night. I mean, so the way we work is definitely changing the world that we work in and how we, how we use our time is, is changing. And efficiency is, is super important to any business, but it's also important to human beings. Um, there needs to be more time. You know, you, you shouldn't be, um, living to work, you know, um, and living just for work, uh, you know, you, you should have like other times where you take your focus from work because you become much more productive uh, when you do have those gaps and when you do have some space to, you know, explore the world or whatever. I think that the nomad, uh, the digital nomad uh, is opening a lot of doors for people to see the world hybrid and, and remote workforces allow that to happen. So regardless of it's freelance or if it's just plain employment, um, giving your people the opportunities to, to work from anywhere, any place, any time um, is pretty phenomenal. And we're finally at a stage in history where that's possible. Not only possible, people have been doing it. And I think that's fantastic. Absolutely, absolutely. It's. Uh, I, I think as as you know, people talk about you know globalization and t to talk about you know the the advance of um, you know of not so much a disparate workforce, but one where people can work on their terms and one where people can you know, do what's best for them, but still get stuff done and still be able to you know work you know and still be able to you know add a benefit to the company. I think the more that people realize. Actually, you don't need to have everyone kind of in an office, nine to five, eight to four, whatever it is, to get things done. That actually, you, you can trust people to be able to do the work that they, you know, would ordinarily do in an office in a situation that, uh, or anywhere where where they are, where they want to. I think that one of um, the best kind of like anal analysts on this um, said that if someone was to, you know, they're the sort of people who take the piss in the office. They're yeah. going to take the piss remotely as well, like. But yeah. people who people will, you know, be productive and work and, you know, move towards doing things which are, you know, um, have meaning and kind of you know nurture their intellectual and creative side, regardless of where they are. And so something yeah. like this, which makes that 
a real possibility and makes it, you know, as uh, takes strips away the uh, you know the red tape of that sort of uh, sort of thing is yeah. only be good. Yeah, no, I agree. And you know, the the more I think as businesses, the more you invest in processes. Uh, like setting OKRs, setting goals, making sure people are, you know, just performing day to day, little check ins. Um, they work wonders. You don't need to be the all seeing eye and babysit adults in the workforce. In fact, the more you empower them and give them a, a lane and a, and a job to be done, the more likely they're going to perform uh, in, in an environment that's good for them. And I think that's important, you know. Work, work. This kind of idea of you know working so many hours for it's stupid. You know, if you're efficient and you get your job done quicker and you've done it really well and you're super happy with it, take the weekend off and another two days until you you know reach your goals. Right? If you're doing that that quick and you're performing, enjoy your life. You know, and and that's really what efficiency is about. You know, it's not waiting for the clock to turn five or six. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, I mean, this is regardless of what people say and uh, like the, the push to get people back into the office and things have to be done a certain way. Like this, this is the reality. This is the way people will want to work. And uh, I think even from, from us working in a in, um, hiring world, particularly in the tech sector, we know that if businesses aren't being prepared to offer, you know, it, not so much hybrid, but, you know, you know remote first, they're going to lose a big chunk of potential talent because you know yeah. people have not only got a taste for it now, but this is the way they're living. This is the way they're working, and they want to work. And if they don't, if businesses don't want to offer that, that's fine. They're going to miss out because their competition will. So yeah, it's, it's I mean, I, find it, I agree. I agree, hundred percent. Especially in tech uh, and even in design, um, a lot of designers, you you have so much. In my opinion, you have. So better focus when you're not around any noise or, you know, you don't have any distractions. It's much easier to really, really focus. Um, and then when you're working in, you know, teams like Microsoft Teams or Slack or any of these uh, environments, you always have the opportunity to, to take a pause and review. And, and, you know, if you're using Agile um, to, you know, get your standups all, all, all organized and you're, you have, milestones to hit everybody knows what they need to do they don't need again any babysitting in some office living their life looking out at smoke snacks stacks or whatever hour and a half commute to an office in a big city it's just it's it's a waste of time so absolutely oh indy well i'm i'm i think this is that's a an excellent place to kind of leave it. If, if anyone wants to find out more about about we do and you know the work that you do at we do, see, I told you it's it's from a <laughs> point of view you've stumbled on board. <laughs> what, what's the best way to kind of uh, find out uh, about you? Like, where can people learn more? Um, go to we do AI, and that's our website. You can download and reserve your username depending on what country you. And um, you should be able to use, reserve your, your username on iOS and Android. And uh, you can find us at wedo.ai is our handle all over the interweb. So Twitter, Instagram, all those spaces. And then I'm Indiana Greg everywhere. There aren't too many of me, so I'm easy to find. You're easy to find. Uh, thank you so much for your, your time uh, this afternoon. And uh, Again, if if you uh, if anyone wants to find out more, that website again is wedo.ai, uh, and we'll be back again in a couple of weeks with another episode of Talking Tech. Please follow us on on our LinkedIn at Client Server, and if you have any questions at all, uh, if you want to watch the stream again, it's available immediately after this on demand, and we there's a chat function on both LinkedIn and on Facebook. If you have any questions that you can think of beyond. Uh, the live stream, uh, we would be happy to pass those on to on to Indy to be able to, to answer those. Uh, but from me here at Client Server HQ, I'd like to thank Indiana Greg again for the time, and we'll see you again next time for more Talking Tech. Thank you again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Michael. Bye-bye.